I think it was about 20 years ago today that my co-founder, Nick T. Berger, and I, together with our superstar team of chief investigators, were informed that we'd been successful in winning funding for equipment and staff to enable us to set up Paradisic. Happy anniversary, Nick. Yay. Inici Yay. <laughs> Initially established with a focus on digitizing researchers' field recordings in various obsolete formats like reels and cassettes, Paradisec developed a new shareable interface to collections that would otherwise have remained isolated and at risk of being forgotten or destroyed. As researchers retired or died, all too often they took with them not only the often unrecorded histories of the creation of their collection, but also links to the speakers or performers with whom they'd collaborated and whose descendants and communities have the greatest interest in the material. So in this photo, you can see baby Nick and baby Linda way back around 2004, about to drive a carload of tapes to our Sydney lab for digitization. Since then, in the past 20 years or so, Paradisec has established part partnerships with numerous cultural centers in the Asia Pacific region, and also collaborated with other digital cultural archives dealing with similar material. Um, through Delamain and this conference is another such collaboration. Um, our collections have grown now to contain 675 discrete collections, millions of files and 195 terabytes of data representing cultural material in over 1335 distinct languages. Unlike many institutional collections, we employ a very small staff we also don't fund our depositors. We depositors, so in that sense, we're unlike Eli. Um, and we have a very, very small staff. So much effort goes into collaborations with relevant bodies, including local and community archives, as well as securing ongoing funding in a very uncertain funding landscape. I've outlined some of how Paradisic has developed over the past 20 years or so because understanding how we got here helps us to imagine where we might go in the future. Many things have changed over the past 20 years and we can only assume that many more will change in the next 10 as we go through the decade of Indigenous languages. Our collections are bigger, so we have different requirements. Globally, we've seen rapid development of our technological base, but adapting our interfaces to new platforms and to take advantage of emerging capabilities is costly. Paradisec's original website no longer runs because the web technology has changed so much. The funding environment that we have is still precarious. We've been grappling with the pandemic and its fallout including unstable geopolitical situations and economic downturn, meaning that our funders and supporters may have fewer resources to share with us. Nevertheless, we do have this opportunity of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. The focus will be on us amongst others, of course. Now at the start of the decade, we have a rare opportunity to dream big and I understand that um, Nick and Mandana have al already laid out some, some ideas of theirs. Later in the presentation, I'll come back to some suggestions from my perspective. But first, an extended detour, uh, bec because I thought that some of you might be wondering why a musicologist is speaking to you today at a conference centred on languages. So I thought I'd give you a rather extended account of some of the ways that I have interacted with various language archives. Of course, linguists, musicologists, and many other disciplines share a common basis in recording field data. On the slide, I've listed some of the types of data that I've collected and lodged in various archives. These, uh, the picture there is from my LB2 collection housed in Paradisic. This collection is um, materials on some popular theatre of the remote Garfagnana region of central Italy. 
So the types of musicology data that I'm talking about here, I've divided into primary documentation, which includes audio, video, images, texts and scores, and secondary documentation that also needs to be lodged to make sense of the primary documentation. So things like indexes, annotations, transcriptions and analyses, as well as interviews with practitioners, which themselves need to be annotated, and field notes and any other relevant contextual data. I've deposited my field recorded music music data of this general type in four different online archives, depending on the source of funding and the type of material. I've included these screenshots just to give you an impression of how differently the collections are presented in each of the four archives in which I've deposited. So firstly, the ELAR archive, the Songs from Western Arnhem Land project that um, I undertook with uh, various um, communities in Western Arnhem Land and researchers including Nick Evans, Murray Gard, Bruce Birch and Isabel O'Keefe back in uh, 2000 and I think uh, nine might have been the first year of that one. Um, the Language Archive in Nijmegen where I contributed music data to a much larger project collection on the wider uh, language. The Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Archive, where I've deposited multiple different song collections from different parts of Australia, and Paradisic, where I've deposited several collections, including the Italian collection LB2 I just mentioned. I hope the slides suggest to you that we still have a way to go in developing common interfaces and formats that help community users to find and navigate our data wherever they end up. Today, I'll be discussing examples from my paradisic collection, but my main focus is the imperfect nature of my analyses, annotations and field recordings. Any field recording can be characterized as too much, too little, too late to quote Denise Williams and Johnny Mathis's earworm. Let me start by talking about some of the things I want to do with my digital recordings and what processes need to be undertaken to allow them to be archived. I'm, first, I need to start with adequate agreements with my community collaborators to explain what I'm recording and where all the recordings will end up. Of course, I also need adequate recording gear. Then, once I've recorded, I need to make sure I've kept all the information about the recording that will enable it to be accessed and reused in the future. Things like applying identifiers and metadata saying who, where, when it was recorded, but also indexing file content and creating appropriate levels of annotation. Ultimately, I aim to use this field recorded data as a source of truth and guidance for research questions I may be developing that I will eventually publish. And I hope that this general, these general observations resonate with um, all those linguists and other field recorders who are out there in the audience today. You'll see that music data isn't so very different um, at these higher levels of planning and uh, recording. Let's get practical. Here's part of what I mean by field music data being too much. Here I'm using an example from my LB2 collection of Tuscan sung popular theatre field recordings in Paradisic, which currently contains 305 items, 3,876 files, it's 5.84 terabytes, of which approximately 255 hours is audiovisual, and covers approximately 2,500 stanzas of this sung theatre. That is way too much data for anyone to be expected to interact with all at once. So we have to break it, interaction with our data into smaller chunks. <laughs> One of my frustrations with archival visualizations of collections is that they don't represent the relations between items and files. For example, 
back when I first established the collection in 2004 or so, I made the decision, now regretted, <laughs> to have a separate item for each physical recording. So the fact that there also exist matching audio, video and image files in other items, are, that information is, has to be buried in the item level descriptive metadata rather than being visible directly from the interface. This is the sort of information that would be really useful for future users of my collection. If I could go back in time, I'd have a separate item for each event, then have all the associated files within that item. Another way field recorded data like this is too much is that each recording is full of noise, people coughing, the occasional dog barking, audience reactions to what's going on, all of which add to the atmosphere, but make it difficult to apply time-saving machine processing to the data. In the case of these recordings of theatrical performances, there are many people participating and gesture and proxemics are also important, but very difficult to capture, especially with audio recordings. <laughs> and many musical features are repeated across stanzas. And of course, the music data captured in the field is not only too much, but also too little and too late. The musical performances of multiple actors are reduced to a single undifferentiated stream. The capture de devices are imperfect, as is our use of them. Audio and video tapes, for example, need to be changed at different times so no one recording stream captures a complete performance. Then there is the inability of the capture devices to record relevant things like audience behaviour that happen out of the focal range of the device, the temperature, the smells and other factors that contribute to the atmosphere. So this level of description is often left to field notes. By the time you want to use your data, you've already lost context. And then what about all the other events you didn't even record? We all have to live with the knowledge that important future questions may be unanswerable because of poor decisions made at the time of recording. For the sake of future users of our carefully archived material, we need to be fair. That is, make our materials findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. That means we need to make it easy for community users to find, access and reuse the materials in our archives. Let me briefly run through some ways in which I think fair principles apply to musical archival material. First of all, we need to plan to be fair by choosing the best affordable equipment, using open formats, developing agreements on ethics, act access, attribution and reuse. Depending on the local re legal regime, music and other creative arts may require special agreements around copyright. Allocating unique identifiers and speci specifying relations between files as well as describing our data using open standards, all help to make our data findable and accessible and most able to be reused by future users. So in terms of replaying and sharing, we need to use standard passable dissemination formats and standard usage agreements that help to make our data interoperable and reusable. But this is where judicious annotation and editing of our data can really make a difference. That is by those who want to reuse it. I won't go into more detail here, but except to note that most archives that are within Delamar, including Paradisic, support this sort of fair deposit archival management and reuse. So we're, we're trying, we're not all the way there yet, but we're trying. Let me now go into a bit more detail about annotation, which really is different for music. As we've seen, annotation of our archival materials is core to fairness. However, annotation is a time consuming process that I think anyone who's undertook it could agree is endlessly extensible. That is, we can never do enough annotation. We need to look after the humans in the loop and optimize our input. Practically speaking, we need to be selective. 
For example, a conservative estimate for me to fully transcribe just the language spoken in my 255 hours of recordings in LB2 is around 3,000 hours. Assuming I could annotate for 10 hours a week, it would take me upwards of six years of brain numbing computer work. And consider that in this case, people are working from a written script that is also archived. It makes much more sense for me to simply indicate what proportion of that script is captured in this particular recording and let future users navigate their way to the rele relevant section of the file. That way, I can devote my limited remaining lifespan to applying my expertise to the really difficult and time-consuming task of music notation for selected excerpts of the recording produced to illustrate particular features of the musical style, which will hopefully help future users to make better sense of my recordings. This slide shows the various components and tools I've used for annotation brought together in a presentation format. I don't have time to go through the full complexity of this slide and you'd probably be very bored if I did, but the processes that lie behind it um, illustrate how I've used a number of different tools to create music excerpts for transcription and analysis. The music notation has been scanned from handwritten scores produced with the assistance of the shareware tool Transcribe. The Excerpts themselves were created in a sound editing program that by copying, mastering and downsampling indexed archival files from Paradisic. The Prat derived text grids you'll see in the middle have been enhanced by highlighting the maxima, that is the syllables of lexical stress, and has been overlaid with annotations showing syllable by syllable how the performers have used glissando, melisma and vibrato, that is musical um, devices, to highlight the musical and linguistic stress. So um, because I don't think I can just keep talking about music without actually um, playing some, I'll, um, let's have a listen to how these two different performers, Andrea Berte and Silvano Fontanini, performed the same line of text on different occasions in 1992. First of all, let's listen to Andrea. For those of you who read musical notation, it's up here. Um, and for those who prefer to just follow along with my um, Prat derived syllable by syllable uh, analysis, it's down here in the middle. So this is Andrea Berte. Now, um, let's hear Silvano Fontanini singing the same line of text, Trafiggi con la spada il mio costato. Please stab me in my side. <laughs> So you will have heard that both both the singers actually um, produce a highly ornamented um, utterance of these syllables of text. Uh, and there, there are quite considerable individual differences, even though the basic template of the musical style is quite, um, quite fixed. The reason that I undertook this particular analysis was really to illustrate the extent to which individual performers can draw on a stock of musical um, features to highlight the text and this is chosen in the moment of performance so at another time Andrea or Silvano might sing that line quite differently as you'll see it's unmetered 
So there's no regular pulse that they need to draw on. All the energy goes into the maximum expressiveness for the text. And my apologies to Mandana, I do have video of this, but it's extremely large and I didn't have time to edit it and present it in um, a, a, a compatible format. So my apologies for that. Um, just let me navigate back. Um, okay. So what with the current state of tools for analysing and segmenting audio, I have adopted a very eclectic practice, as you can see. I've used four different tools at least to be able to produce this particular um, combination of data. And it, I have to say that this is... In creating this level of close, fine-grained analysis that's illustrating particular um, features of the musical style is incredibly time-consuming to index and annotate. I'm not going to apologise about it only being a very small amount of material because I believe it does add a lot of value to the collection to have these fine-grained analyses, even though I'll never live long enough to be able to apply this to 2,500 stanzas, each of which consists of eight lines. So here we've, we've just got like one, one thousandth of uh, the material. As long as my output can be transcoded in future into standard machine readable formats, um, I'm happy that my work will be able to be um, passed on to those who need to um, see it. In the case of this Garfagnino material that's held in Paradise XLB2 collection, I've used infrastructure developed by Paradise X, the data loader, to provide copies of all materials to the Museo Italiano dell'Immaginario Folklorico, an autonomous archive run by volunteers in the remote Garfagnana Valley where the Maggio has been historically performed. Though in recent years, especially with the pandemic, it has gone into considerable abeyance. <laughs> Hence the desire of people there to make sure that the, these materials are accessible to contemporary performers as inspiration and guidance. The materials that I've um, copied from Paradisec have also been shared with all the individuals I've collaborated with, and they're also available to watch and copy by users of the museum. And for those who might question the usefulness of music notation, um, I can report that a book I produced uh, in 1994 has been extensively used recently by members of the Gorfiliano Company to revive the practice of um, Majul Sung theatre in that area. The Museo is one example of an entirely community-run autonomous archive, and it shares many of the same needs and benefits with autonomous local archives elsewhere around the world. Staffed entirely by volunteers, its audiovisual collections have been drawn from a variety of sources, supplemented by additional recordings contributed on an ongoing basis by community members. It actively seeks collaborations with affiliated researchers like me to assist in preparing funding applications, provide pointers to training materials, to help them manage their collections and so on. An increasing recognition of the um, inherent cultural bias in structures and operations of archives and the colonizing origins of many institutional archives have led to calls for participatory archiving to allow users more say in structuring and managing collections. So autonomous archives like the Museo have um, really built their collection around local needs. Numerous initiatives including the Museo, have established such autonomous archives that exist outside of government, although often drawing on government support. 
and many have sought to take advantage of the affordances of digital technologies to reimagine the relationship between people and collections. And um, some important Australian researchers who've written about this include Kimberly Christen, Michael Christie, Martin Nakata, and Sabra Thorna. In Australia, the Indigenous Remote Communications Association assists community organisations in planning and managing such collections, while in uh, some areas, a, such as Central Australia, a youth link-up service supports workstations, some lo loaded with co local collections in multiple remote locations. Community language centres like Wangamaya Pilbara Languages Centre, who are presenting here, I believe, uh, have been supported in part by the Australian Government's Indigenous Languages and Arts Funding Scheme. And together with other similar centres, they provide other network of community-based infrastructure coordinated by umbrella bodies like First Languages Australia. Many autonomous archives have entered into partnerships with more established institutional archives, such as the um, Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Audiovisual Archive to help with otherwise very expensive data backups of their collections. Okay, that's the end of our rather long detour into the world of archiving mus music field recordings. I salute the few other presenters at the conference who are tackling music related topics, for example, the Wongamaya mob, and I look forward to hearing more about their research. So far, I hope that my comments about my own research practice have resonated with other archivists, linguists and community members in the audience. To return to the main topic of the conference, I'm delighted to see that many here are already presenting important ideas about finding common ground with community organisations and with language activists. Of course, we in the digital cultural archiving community have our own community of practice of fellow archivists, researchers and data managers. And we also have responsibilities to the general publics that advise and support what we do through various funding sources, whether government or philanthropic. Nevertheless, we must recognize that the content of our archives is what matters to our community users and collaborators. <coughs> On our journey through the decade of indigenous languages, it's our precious indigenous collaborators, speakers, performers, community advocates, cultural activists, who will guide us to navigate on our journey through this decade. As I say, said, our primary partners are thus community practitioners. We need to align our understandings and practices with their goals and aspirations. We need to recognize and resist the colonial baggage that's inherent in our knowledge disciplines and in some archival practices. We need to listen to the ancestors whose voices and images are released from our data whenever they are accessed. We need to recognize the trauma and deep emotional connection that can be experienced by those with cultural connections to the records that we are temporary custodians for. We need to hope too that the content of our archives may outlast us and the archives themselves in whatever form. We need to listen to our community collaborators and co-design our future activities, including finding common ground to enable us to leverage future funding and support for our joint aspirations. So finally, here are my suggestions on some possible avenues for setting some targets for 2032, or is it 2031, whatever the end of the um, decade is. This of course is not an exhaustive list and I know that you have already heard and will continue to hear more suggestions um, to add to this, but I hope that this will provide some uh, starting point for discussions. So the first thing I have listed here is a continuation of what we've already, we are already doing at this conference, 
We need to keep building connections and stories to allow the wonderful richness of our enterprise to shine through. We need to reach out to new parties with whom we can find common cause, and we need to break down any barriers that hinder us sharing our stories with each other and the broader public. Too many academic publications about Indigenous languages and knowledges are effectively hidden from the Indigenous people most concerned by requiring subscriptions. Let's commit to publishing open access. Perhaps we can plot out a 10-year communication program of conferences and publications. The second point, amplify connections to influence policies. We need to be proactive to make sure that we can influence and change the, where necessary the frameworks that matter to us. Given our current reliance on web technologies, for example, do we need a seat at the table at the World Wide Web Consortium? at the International Council on Archives. Who will be our champions? Let's plan how to get there. <clears throat> Third, big fixes for anything holding us back. Mandana's already mentioned some of these in the immediately preceding presentation. Um, we need to be working towards implementing multilingual and multimodal interfaces to enable access and participation from as wide a range as possible of our stakeholders. Why isn't it easier to create and curate a multilingual multimodal collection, let alone access it? Maybe we won't get all the way there in 10 years, but let's set some targets for how many new modes of interaction with community users we'd like to see. Finally, let's make some plans as to how we're going to further promote internal diversity within our own organisations. Let's create some pathways and strategies to make sure that the voices of Indigenous people are embedded within our management and heard wherever they need to be. We already have some major strides in this direction. Let's not stop. Do we need a structured program of internships, mentoring and training to make this kind of thing happen? Let's build that into applications to our funders. Let's make it business as usual, not something that's added.